Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Straight Up Texas podcast presented by Whataburger. A celebration of the Texas spirit that we see in the Rangers and all around us in this great state. I'm Rangers broadcaster Jared Sandler, joined as always by J.B. Sauceda, the founder of Texas Humor. And later, we're going to be joined by Cody Cannon of Whiskey Myers, a great country band. And I really enjoy talking to Cody. You know you're going to enjoy that conversation as well. So looking forward to that. Yeah. And, you know, we here on the Straight Up uh, Texas podcast want to let you know that although it is the official podcast of the Texas Rangers, uh, we're obsessed with Texas and uh, we're obsessed with a lot of things uh, around Texas. But more specifically, we're here to celebrate the spirit, the resolve, uh, a lot of the things that the Texas Rangers have. But you know, the, the, the values and, and the attributes of really all Texans. And so uh, we're going to talk about a lot of things. We're going to talk about a little bit of baseball here in a second, and then we'll dive deeply into the state of Texas. So, yeah, let's let's do it. First, I got I to gotta let everyone know. I'm first I'm wearing this awesome Whataburger shirt again. Second time. So the, the peaches and cream shake. All right. That's uh, it's available for a limited time. We've talked about the Pico de Gallo burger and the Dr. Pepper shake. Can't forget about the peaches and cream shake, right? Peaches and cream is just this classic dessert. Love it. But what about in shake form? It's even better. Uh, You can get it at your local Whataburger. Again, it's available for a limited time. I think it's great like 12 months out of the year, but I know some people uh, really kind of prefer it in summer and, you know, summer's maybe winding down. I don't know like the technical Summer is 12 months out of the year. Yeah. Yeah, So you can go get it. I I wish it was available 12 months out of the year, but it is only a limited time. Uh, So go and check out the peaches and cream shake at Whataburger ASAP. Yeah. Well, awesome. Uh, so what are you, uh, what are you seeing on the Rangers front? Uh, I know that, uh, we had the, uh, the Roberto Clemente award that just got issued, uh, here, uh, in the last, in the last couple of days. So, uh, we had, we had a representation, uh, with that award, uh, with, with Jose Trevino. Yeah. So, you know, really cool that he is the, the nominee for the Rangers this year. It would be extra special if he were to win the award. Uh, but just being a nominee is, you know, a, a great, honor that I think is very fitting of of Jose and and what he stands for and who he is and I'll be honest I'll, I'll share a quick story uh you know the the Rangers have a nominee every year and I think it would be unfair for me to suggest that previous nominees have not appreciated it uh, but I don't know that I've ever come across a nominee who has been as excited as Jose was we were in the dugout uh The other day, this is it's Thursday, Thursday morning, uh, and the Rangers are getting ready to play the uh, the Astros tonight. Earlier this week, it was uh, Tuesday, maybe uh, we learned that Jose had you know been named the nominee and he was just so giddy. I was sitting with Emily Jones. He walked by us and we we both congratulated him. And, you know, a lot of times it's a hey, thanks so much, you know, and and you know, the, the person means that they're not rude or anything. It's just like to them, it's cool. You know, it's, it's great. Jose stopped and was like, Oh, thank you so much. This is so cool. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm so excited. And, you know, we spoke for a few minutes and he just, he shared how much it means to him because it's such a big part of who he is. Yeah. Uh, that's what I was going to ask. I mean, wh- wh- why do you, why do you feel like it was so impactful to him? Yeah. I, I think it's such a big part of his identity. Mm. Um, he is, you know, whether the cameras are rolling or not, he's just inherently a very charitable, giving, generous person. He's a compassionate person who cares about people. When you talk to him, you don't get the sense that he's just kind of in robot mode, completing a conversation, even if it's not like a charitable setting. He just he cares about interaction and people. And, you know, he spoke about his father, his late father, who had such an impact on his life and who really instilled the importance of giving back and, and being charitable, uh, both in the like direct sense of, hey, let's give back to charity and let's give back to our community, but also in the indirect sense of just doing things for others, you know, living a, a life that, you know, you hear about like servant leadership and stuff like that. And so I just think it's a big part of, of who, uh, who Jose is. And uh, it's a really special honor for anyone. Uh, but it's it's extra special when you you witness someone embrace it as much as Jose has thus far. Well, who else are you seeing? Uh, you know, so that that's you know on the charitable front. But as far as you know, performance on the field uh, has anybody been standing out to you here in the last week? Uh, the series with with the Astros or or anything like that? 
Yeah, well, I, I'd say Leody Tavares. Unfortunately, he was kind of charitable in the wrong way earlier this year. <laughs> he was giving a lot of outs to uh, the opposing team. It was just a rough year uh, to start the season for Leody. Went down, and all of a sudden, his charity work was more directed to his team. He had a great stretch with AAA Round Rock, demonstrated more power than he had in any previous uh, stop in the minor leagues over the last few years. And then he came back up and I think there's a lot of excitement and anticipation that maybe something clicked and got off to a really rough start again. And now you start to worry, is it mental? Um, what's missing? What, why is it not translating? And then on, I think it was August 30th against Colorado, he went two for three, had a Homer and a double. And it was like, okay, let's, this looks good. Let's see if it continues. And it has. Uh, and so over the last sitting, it's like 14, 15 games. Again, this is Thursday morning. So getting ready for the final game of the Astro series, but through the first three games and over the last 14, he's hitting, uh, around 260. He's got an OPS well over 800 and it's just, he's, he's putting together really competitive at bats. And this is significant because I think of all the players on the roster right now, especially position players, the guy who's got the, the highest ceiling, the guy who's got the best chance to just truly impact uh, this team in a huge way is Leody Tavares. And it's not just because of the bat. He, he already plays an exceptional center field. He's got gold glove potential. Uh, he already uh, runs the bases and, and just flies around, you know, both defensively and, and on the bases and is an impact there. And so now it's just a matter of how good of a hitter is he? How good of a hitter will he be? How good of a hitter can he develop into? And he doesn't need to be a great hitter to be an impact player just because of how good he is defensively. But the better the hitter he is, the better the player he is, obviously. And he's got a chance to be a really special player. He just turned 23 on September 8th. So he is still so young. He is way ahead of schedule. But I do think one of the bright spots here of late is just the fact that Leody Tavares is looking more and more competitive at the plate. And I'm really excited now to see what he does next year. Next year will be his third, not his third full season, but he spent part of last year at the major league level, part of this year at the major league level. And then hopefully that experience, the good and the bad will prepare him for next year. And hopefully he makes the team on opening day and doesn't look back. And it's, it's, you know, not necessarily the beginning, but the the continuation of what hopefully will be a really, really nice career for Leody Tavares. Awesome. You excited to uh, get into this interview? Yeah, let's do it. So Cody Cannon, Whiskey Myers, it was awesome chatting with him. It's really been so great chatting with all of our guests. We've been so thankful. we got a great team, Tim Johnson and Hannah Wing, who uh, have put us in positions to, to interview some great people. So if this is your first time listening or watching even the Straight Up Texas podcast would really invite you to go back and listen to the past episodes, uh, talking to people like Madison Koshin and uh, Matthew McConaughey, just to name a few uh, musicians, Travis Heim, a pit master, really have had a, a lot of fun talking to folks and, and Cody Cannon, no different. So here we go. Uh, the Straight Up Texas podcast presented by Whataburger. Go get that peaches and cream shake after you listen to our conversation here with Cody Cannon of Whiskey Myers. Uh, Cody, thanks so much for being with us. I appreciate y'all having me. So we always like to start off with this question. Uh, this is the Straight Up Texas podcast. What does Straight Up Texas mean to you? You can take it in any direction you'd like. It could be one word. It could be uh, a reaction. But when you hear the phrase Straight Up Texas, what comes to mind? Uh, straight Up Texas. I would say independent would be a good kind of thing that kind of gets the Texas vibe a very independent mindset. And how, how has that maybe shaped you as a person or you as a, a musician or Whiskey Myers as a, as a team, as a group, as a band, uh, that, that independent mindset? Wow. Probably a lot. I was just raised that way, you know, independence, free thinking, self-reliance, stuff like that. Um, and that really does kind of apply to our band a lot because the main thing when we started is we we wanted to actually be an independent band. We never wanted to sign a record deal. We never wanted to do the stuff that the other people were reaching for. We just wanted to make our own music and just literally be our own thing. And so that applies literally 24-7 to our business. 
Cody, how did the band form? So you guys are all from more or less the same area. What's the origin story of Whiskey Myers? And, and also the origin story of the name Whiskey Myers. Well, that is a myth, you know, and uh, there's not really a true story on the origin of the name. There's uh, several different stories. Um, it's kind of really a mystic type thing. Uh, but as far as us forming, we all grew up together. Uh, some of us played ball together when we were little. That's how we knew each other. And just being from uh, surrounding little small towns around that Palestine area is not very big. So you you kind of know everybody. So we're the, the core of us are really all from the same place. And uh, as far as the becoming a band, it was probably just lack of options. We weren't going to be a doctor or anything. Now you got you guys uh, took some time off. Um, you were saying it was about two years or so. You know what what drove that and and what brought you back into uh, touring and everything else aggressively? Coronavirus. <laughs> yeah, we. So I mean, but for full two, for the full two years, were you guys already off? No, it was a year that? and a half. Basically, it shut us down. So when when all that stuff started happening, I think the NBA closed that night. Uh, we were in maybe Cleveland or Cincinnati or something. And we had to wait for the mayor or governor or somebody to come out on TV to say if we could load in or not. And they said, Hey, you can't play if it's over X amount of people. And from then it just, boom, it was just domino effect. And, uh, which it just shut us down. And then we really didn't do anything, uh, as far as live stuff. We had did some, we did a streaming thing and we did like a parking lot thing at the, at the ballpark, the new ballpark. And, uh, and that was really it. So uh, we decided it was best if we just got out of it and just took off until we could play again, you know. How'd you stay busy the, the whole time? Because I mean, I know a handful of musicians, you know, went into the studio yeah. or, you know, went home and wrote, uh, you know, did you sit by the pool or were you writing? What, we just all we went home and made babies. That's how we stayed busy. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, you did mention you've got a, uh, yeah, a new all child. Of us, we, uh, yeah, we went home and, and made babies during uh, quarantine. Uh, but yeah, we, we come we come out and I was writing and uh, the guys were writing and we, we did a new record that'll be out as soon as we can get it out. Everything's still kind of backed up um, on the production side of it, like producing the actual vinyls and stuff. So uh, yeah, writing a new record and just kind of enjoying life. For us, I didn't get too stir crazy. Um, man, we've been doing this. It was kind of a good break for me because I've been, I mean, every day we've been on the road pretty much for like, at that point, maybe like 13 years or something, 14 years, just nonstop. So I wasn't too heartbreak, you know, heartbroken over having to stay at home for a little bit. It was the first time I'd ever got to be at home a lot you know, during my adult life. What uh, I, I want to ask you about that, but first I, you mentioned you know, obviously a break and, and you got stuff kind of in the works there. You know, I know a ton of fans of Whiskey Myers and, and just bands in general who they've been starving for new stuff. They're, they've been starving for the the creation and, and the development. So what what are some of the things that you guys have in the works that people should look out for? Or maybe stuff that's uh, just kind of been rolled out that people can access right now. Um, <clears throat> mainly just the uh, the new album coming out. Not, I, don't, I don't have a release date on it. It's done. We're just waiting uh, to get artwork finalized and then kind of you got to get in the line now because of how uh, production is because of Corona, like producing the vinyls and stuff. And so that, that's really it. That's what we're waiting on. But the record's done. Uh, and then we're touring right now. So we started off in, uh, in the summer with Jamie Johnson and uh, did that deal all summer. And then now we're doing our shows, which are all kind of makeup shows from uh, roughly two years ago. What's it feel like to be back on the road? It's good, man. It's good to be, you know, you got to work. You got to do that. You go crazy. If not, you got to stay busy. You know, even, even when we're off, I stay busy doing stuff and, and creating different things, uh, different things, you know, I can't talk about all of them right now, but yeah, you just got to keep your hands busy. Idle hands are bad. I, I'm, you mentioned, so this is like a random one off. You mentioned the artwork and I guess I've never really given much thought to this. Who all is involved in the artwork of an album? Is it is is it just like whoever the most artistic is? Is it something that you guys 
as a group, the six of you don't even deal with at all. Uh, I guess it's probably different band to band, artist to artist, but uh, how does the, what's that process like the artwork uh, for a new album? Uh, we're directly involved always. We at least give a direction, even if we're not the uh, one drawing it. John, our guitar player, uh, did actually drew some of the artwork for the last album and did that. Um, on this album, it'll be somebody else, you know, either drawing it or do, doing the pictures and stuff like that. But they've always, we've always gave them a direction to go with. So uh, that's how we do it. Usually, usually I, I have something that, that pops into my mind and then we all kind of work together to kind of get a vision. So there's six of y'all. And, you know, I think you think of characteristics of Texas, uh, you know, the, the, the Southern comfort, the relationships, the, the community is a big part of it, but so is strength. And you just talked about, you know, earlier, what it means to you, the, the independent thinking, how do you all make decisions as a group? Uh, because I, I imagine there are certain things where you guys are all without even communicating in a line with, you know, whatever the decision is, but then I imagine there's certain things where some of you guys want to go left and, and, you know, the others want to go right. Maybe someone wants to go straight ahead. So how, how do you guys work as a team when it comes to decision making? Um, yeah, it's kind of a collective deal. Um, we haven't, we've been fortunate. We've never really had a, just a big split or somebody feel, uh, strongly in a certain way. It's always a conversation, you know, but we, you kind of know what's right. If you have a decision to make, it's, it's usually, I mean, sometimes you'll get a real split deal, but we hadn't had that. It's, it's kind of an easy thing. You just know what to do. And so it's, it's just been just kind of an easy democratic uh, way of going about things as far as those, you know, creative decisions and stuff like that. But as far as like music or something or a song, or maybe, maybe you, one person has an idea to do a certain thing and somebody has something that's completely different. Well, we'll just listen, you know, we'll be, ah, oh, no, no, we should do this. We should do that. And it's like, well, shit, let's just play it and see what it sounds like. Let's play it your way, play it your way, play it my way. And then once you do that, you, it's, it's, it's really easy to hear. You're like, Oh, that way's the best. Simple. See that way. I mean, what's that like for you when you're off the road? I mean, do you, do you sit around and play music much? Do you listen to music or are you just, you, are you off the clock when you're off the clock? I'm completely off the clock. I used to listen to music a lot and do it now. I'm only playing like when it's time for me to start writing for a new record and then I'll start getting in the zone. But uh, it's so much work, especially because we produced, you know, last two records we produced everything ourselves, always writing songs and stuff like that. We're doing like everything. So like me, I just completely check out until it's time for me to start writing again. And so I don't listen to a lot of music and stuff I'm at all, really. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming when you're recording, you're not doing it there in Palestine. Are, are you you going to Nashville? Are you going to, uh, you know, Fort Worth or something like that to one of the studios? I mean, what, what do you normally do all y'all's recording? Um, we did a few in Nashville. The last two we did at the Sonic Ranch out in Tornillo, Texas out in the desert um outside of el paso it's a super super rad studio out there what's special about that place the sonic ranch everything the vibe you know vibe and the atmosphere the equipment the equipment's amazing we uh we're really particular about when it comes to recording what kind of equipment we use old guitars sound better old amps sound better uh certain boards stuff like that um and so it just has everything. So we really like that place. So we did our last two records there. I'm curious, Cody, you know, no band, or at least I don't think, you know, a band just kind of pops up and then five minutes later, they're exactly where they want to be. And I know there, there are so many bands who try to make it and, you know, make it as such an ethereal phrase, I guess, you know, it's uh, eye of the beholder, but uh, you know, they, they don't necessarily achieve the success they want, whatever, however they define that overnight. And there's a lot of challenges. There's the the grind. And that's, you know, another big quality of, you know, what we kind of define as, as a true Texan is the perseverance and whatnot. I'm curious, what are some of the challenges that you all had early on or some of the things that stand out about the journey that Whiskey Myers has been on to get to where you all 
are now not, you know, obviously COVID is, is a challenge everyone faced, but even well before that in the, the earlier stages. Um, challenges for us was because we, we were playing like country bars and we're from the country and we have country elements to our music, but we also wanted to incorporate a lot of rock and roll and blues because we grew up with those influences. And uh, that was the thing for us. We wanted to be different and just be free to create whatever kind of song we wanted to. And, you know, sometimes that isn't receptive when you first start out. And so I think just being different was probably a little bit, even, you know, somewhere like Texas, it was still like, oh, that's not country enough for me. It's like, oh, really? I'm from Natchez, man. You got a pipe daylight back there. You're from Dallas. You're telling me I ain't country. Uh, so it was, it was we kind of had that kind of stuff, you know, oh, y'all need to play some two-step in music. And, and those things we had to overcome sticking to your guns and being like, man, I, I don't care. I, you know, I'm doing it this way. And that's for people in the, in the industry, you know, maybe you're trying to get a song on the radio and they say, Oh, it's, that's not right. You can't do it that way. You, you have to, it has to be more like this. And, uh, and we were just like, nah, this, this is what we're going to do. Uh, you know, if we go down in flames, we're going to go down our own way. And so I think that was a big thing that we had to overcome is people not being open to, to hearing the music a little bit different than what they were used to. Because sometimes people don't know that, like people won't like it until they're told that, that they can like it, right? And so it's like, after, you know, maybe you get some success and then everybody, everybody loves it, right? But at first they're like, oh, I don't like that. It's too different. That, that makes a ton of sense. Was there a point where you broke out of that? You know, maybe it was just going beyond just playing at Texas bars, but maybe when you got out of Texas where that went from being a challenge to being a, a, a benefit and, and being different and, and allowing you all to stand out, or is that something you still feel like you fight to this day? Uh, the fact that you are so different and, and there are people who are trying to pull you back in a, maybe a more true like Texas country and country only sort of mold. Um, nobody really tries to pull us back or anything anymore. Cause we've just, you know, we've kind of made our own path. Um, so no, we were so happy to be a part of the Texas scene and stuff. It's, it's such a great scene. Um, and, and so that was, that was amazing. I wouldn't have wanted to come out of any other scene, but for us, we also didn't want to be regional. You know, we're like, if we're going to make music, yeah, of course we're from Texas, but why can't people in London listen to it? Why can't people in New York listen to it? Why can't people in California listen to it? You know what I mean? It's it's for the world, right? You create something from nothing. When you write a song, it doesn't exist. So why would you um, create it just for a certain group of people? You want you know whoever to be able to listen to it, whoever to be able to come to your shows. So that was something for us that we were like, we always wanted to tour. You know, obviously we were fortunate enough to be able to cut our teeth in Texas, but we always wanted to tour wherever people wanted to hear our music. And so I think that helped with that mindset uh, for us getting out and being able to play really all over the world and have a good fan base. So I want to ask you about this. Uh, recently in, in baseball news, uh, there was the Field of Dreams game. I don't know how much you you got to see that, yeah. but the White Sox yeah, and Yankees the played. Bus. Yeah, so they played in Dyersville, Iowa. And a guy that I guess has a connection to you all uh, was front and center. That's Kevin Costner. And yeah. you guys appeared, you, you guys, Yellowstone is, you know, which is, a, you know, for those unfamiliar, a show that Kevin Costner has started in here more recently than the movie Field of Dreams, uh, you know, among his catalog of work. But Whiskey Myers' story, I guess, uh, uh, I don't want to say can't be told without Yellowstone, but Yellowstone certainly is a part of it. How did that how did how did that crossover help you all grow and, and take some of the next steps and maybe gain some more notoriety? It was huge for us. Uh, it was really just unexpected. You know, uh, Taylor Sheridan called us. He's the I don't know what you call it, creator, director, producer. I don't know on the, the movie side of it. He's he's that guy. Uh, he's a director, producer. And um, he called and and asked if it asked us if we wanted to come up and do it and we're like yeah man that sounds really cool but we didn't expect the response you know what happened after that we didn't expect that at all we were just like yeah that sounds pretty cool and it sounds like a really good idea for a show that would that would be fun to go do that 
And so it was really that simple. It's like, yeah, we'll fly up and do it. And then just kind of the whirlwind that happened after was really amazing because we were fortunate because we, we were getting out and, and, and touring and we were having really good crowds and stuff. But we never had any like massive radio singles or, or doing anything like that to reach like millions of people at once. We just didn't have that format. And uh, and so when that happened, it was just it was like night and day difference. You know, they just took off like that. And the, like all three of the records that we had out at that time, like and so one of them had been out forever. All went to it was like one, two, three and stuff like that. Um and so, yeah, just the effect of that was quite shocking. <laughs> so this is obviously the Straight Up Texas podcast. And, uh, you know, you guys being from Texas and uh, this show being focused on that, we like to dive into some more specifically uh, Texan things. And uh, one of the, the best ways to pivot is to talk a little bit about a restaurant that is all over the state and a sponsor of our show as well. And that restaurant is Whataburger. So when you're on the road, uh, the, you know, uh, Texas kind of stoplight or stop sign uh, that a lot of folks see is, is uh, those orange and white uh, upside down arches, the uh, W Whataburger sign. And uh, how often does a Whiskey Myers bus uh, pull into a Whiskey Meyer or into a Whataburger parking lot? And uh, when it does, what do you guys order? Pretty often um, in our career, I'm sure we've stopped at Whataburger at two or three in the morning more times than I can count. <laughs> At that time of night, I'm going to say everybody gets a whole bunch of taquitos. So I'm going to say sausage, egg, and cheese taquito. Because usually, yeah, it's it's in the morning. And so they usually get freaked out because you order like 100 taquitos at one time or something like that. So, uh, yeah, we've been to a couple of Walmart or Whataburger parking lots in our day. You know, diving into to other food, I mean, I see you're wearing a meat church hat. And uh, those guys obviously are just... Uh, in a way, like the patron saints of uh, barbecue uh, in, in Texas. What do, do you guys have like a specific barbecue joint that you guys like to hit when you're on the road or a place that you always kind of find your way home to um, when you're looking for barbecue? Uh, yeah, way home to, yeah. There's a place that's been around forever in Palestine called Ships. And it's amazing. And I, I still go there uh, quite often when I'm at home because uh, I don't live too far from there. And then uh, Stanley's in Tyler is actually a really amazing barbecue place too. Now, uh, you know, growing up in East Texas, was there any place that you guys would vacation to? Your family would regularly go down? Like my family, you know, it didn't matter how nice the beaches were anywhere else. We always went from Houston to Corpus Christi to, to stay on the beach there. You know, wh where, did, uh, where did folks growing up in your hometown travel to for, for vacation? Hey, that's funny because see, you know, we didn't have a whole lot of money. So usually my vacation, we would go stay at the La Quinta and go to a Rangers game in Six Flags, man. We did that. At, we did that every summer religiously. So that was something that that's funny. I don't even know if that La Quinta is still there. Or even remember exactly where it was at, but it's over there uh, by the ballpark. And uh, so we would go there and go to Six Flags. Then I had an aunt that lived in uh in Florida when I was young, so I, we could go out there and see her every once in a while. But but every summer we went to Six Flags in uh, a Rangers game. What Cody? I'm curious. You guys have obviously toured all all throughout Texas, and and maybe the there are places that you uh, used to tour that you don't anymore. They don't make it on the uh, the schedule, the calendar. So I, I guess two two part question. Just generally speaking, your favorite place to go in Texas to perform, like a venue, and then is there one, is there a bar that you don't go to anymore or, or somewhere that you've maybe graduated from that you miss going to, that you, you guys had a blast uh, performing at? Yeah, so I would say a tie on, the, on the, the two favorite places would be Whitewater Amphitheater, and uh, we still play there, and Billy Bob's are two special places that we still get to play. Um, and far as one that we don't play anymore, we used to play Hurricane Harry's at College Station a lot. Uh, and uh, <laughs> we're probably too old to probably play it all the time anymore. But uh, that was a fun one for many years. That was the mainstay of ours. That was a show we looked forward to was going to College Station and playing. 
the ones that you mentioned where you still do, uh, Billy Bob's, you said Whitewater Hall, I believe. Why, why are those two places so special to y'all? Um, I think Billy Bob's because of the history and just that was something that you wanted to do, right? You wanted to um, have enough fans to be able to play on that main stage and then just walking back in that green room, you see all the uh, squares on the wall and, and, you know, the, you know, Waylon Jennings square and his signatures and the Merle Haggards and the ZZ Tops and, and all that. So just the history and the walls. Um, and then Whitewater's just, Amphitheater's just a really cool place. It's right on the Guadalupe River and uh, it's a big place. And it's just a, that's just a really nice venue. And then I'm curious, just another, I'm hitting you with another two-parter. Uh, musical influences i'm sure that it ranges throughout uh you know the band but for you specifically uh musical influences in general and then maybe you know musical influences from the state of texas whether they play what is branded as texas music or just an artist who happens to be from the state of texas right so yeah it varies a lot but i grew up like you're talking about young really right influence growing up so Man, my, my parents listened to, to country music and stuff. So it was people like, uh, you know, Hank Jr., Alan Jackson, Keith Whitley, Merle Haggard, like all that kind of uh, mainstay country music. Um, and then also that, you know, Leonard Skinner and uh, the Marshall Tucker Band, Allman Brothers, things like that, ZZ Top. Those were, were kind of the things that, that I remember growing up. So it was that kind of that, southern rock stuff and then the uh just country music i come from a country music home they i mean that's what you listen to and uh so i would say that that's it you, you know you, it changes when you get older you get different influences and you listen to different stuff when you start getting older you listen to more like you know leonard cohen or, or bob dylan maybe when you didn't when you were eight you were just listening to what, what was ever on the radio and uh, like little feet and stuff like that so I think it always changes uh, what you're listening to. But, it, man, it's so varied, too, because a lot of the guys, you know, just grew up on on old classic rock. So, you know, uh, Led Zeppelin and stuff like that, and the Beatles and the Stones. Uh, and then you have, you know, other people that were really big in Nirvana and stuff like that. So ours is just kind of an influence of everything we listened to growing up. Um, and I think that's why our styles is just kind of random from song to song, just really because we really embrace all those different genres. How often do, does your family come with you on the road? Do you uh, are you able to do that much? Um, yeah, you know, if we're playing close, like at Whitewater, my my family was there. Um, so if it's relatively close, we're playing the rhyming, and I'll fly them up for that, but. A lot of the shows you can't, especially with having a little baby, you know, or, you know, he's not six months old, but my wife would come with me uh, before we had our son more often than, you know, they get to come. What do you, what do you look forward to most about raising your kid in Texas? I mean, is, is that a, you know, I, I remember when, when I had my daughter, I was so excited to be able to take her to uh, Space Center Houston and, you know, the Texas City Dyke and all the stuff that I did as a kid. I mean, are there, uh, you know, other, other than La Quinta and uh, Six Flags <laughs> and stuff, is there anything that you're excited about doing with your son in Texas? I think just raising him how uh, I was raised is very important. Teaching him things I learned from my dad and he learned from his dad. And, you know, passing that thing, you know, that thing on down, that's what it's all about. Uh, so, yeah, he's going to grow up how I did. A little bit, not the exact same, but. Uh, just teaching the skills, the things I learned, how to hunt, fish, you know, play music, uh, enjoy the outdoors, enjoy sports. Um, I've already got a bat and cage spot picked out for him. I'm going to build for him in a couple years. Uh, but, yeah, it's just that, man. You, you, you look at on those fond memories that you had when you were young, you know, and you hope that you can do the same thing for them. Right, Cody, I, you just mentioned the batting cage, and I, I wanted to make sure to circle back to this. You mentioned uh, that you and your bandmates kind of all grew up together, played ball with some of them. Uh, yeah. I'm guessing you meant baseball, though that could mean anything. I'm curious, yeah. what's the yeah. what's the Cody Cannon baseball scouting report? What, what were you like as a, as a ball player back in the day? 
Um, I would say I was not a power hitter. <laughs> uh, I would say the scouting report would be uh, good contact, spreads the ball around the field, a, a good, decent eye, not too many strikeouts, not much power, and uh, a good defensive player. Where'd you play? What did you play in the field? Second base. Did you have any favorite players growing up, guys, you really kind of looked up to or, or not really? Yeah. Um, of course, if you're from Texas, you always got to say Nolan, you know. Uh, so Nolan, Pudge, um, Michael Young. I was a huge Michael Young fan because that would have been about the time that I was in high school and stuff. Uh, so those would probably have been my three that I really liked. Yeah. And then big, big. I, was, I loved Michael Young, so and, – and Kinsler, too, man. I remember when Kinsler was there, he was really good, too. But uh, I'd say Nolan Pudge and Michael Young. Have you got a chance – I mean, a lot of – listen, all four of those guys have been around the organization, uh, and, and I know you've obviously been connected to the Rangers organization. You mentioned playing outside of Globe Life Field uh, here recently. What Have you met any of those guys? You've been able to meet Pudge, Ian, Michael, any, Nolan, any of them? Five no, we see Pudge on our airplane one time, but we we're too scared to go talk to him. We were young. Uh, we we're flying into Dallas from somewhere. I don't even know. No, we've, we've got to meet um, a lot of ball players and, and NASCAR drivers and, and football players and stuff like that. But uh, I don't think I've met. I haven't, I haven't met any of them for sure because I would remember that. All right, before we let you go, Cody, again, you know, just for people who are interested in, in, in getting the Whiskey Myers experience, maybe they, you know, they've never dove into Whiskey Myers or are big fans. What, you know, what, what should people look out for? How can they tune into to what you guys have coming up, albums? And, and I know you don't have a release date for your next album, but just where can people go to, to get all the Whiskey Myers they want? Uh, WhiskeyMyers.com and then all the, the socials there's about a million socials now i don't even know what they are but i just tell people just google it. that works google is a powerful tool cody we really appreciate it. we're so glad that that you and some of your musical peers are back on the road and, and doing what you love and we appreciate you taking some time out of your day to to speak with us i appreciate it yeah thanks Thank man i appreciate it all right, until next time, this is the Straight Up Texas podcast presented by Whataburger. We'll talk to you later.